as our newest uh, youth, professional youth staff. Well, discipleship involves rebuilding one's life around Jesus Christ. We began the study by studying a selection of discipleship tools. And then last week, we observed that actually most of discipleship actually happens when we have sufficient passion to actually use those tools to help rebuild uh, something new in us. And that something starts in our own soul. And then uh, after it starts to impact us inside, it impacts how we live and all the different roles and relationships of life. Now, because for some reason, uh, my time in this series is limited, um, I, I'm going to just pull a whole lot of things together. So today we're going to look at career and community together uh, and consider uh, all the authority structures outside of the home and the church. So instead of studying about the word uh, and prayer and witness, fellowship, uh, as, uh, worship as tools, we're going to start looking at how do you use those things to shape our lives amidst the institutions of our society in a way that is distinctly Christian and follows Christ. And our text today is a great one. It's a well-known one. It's a little challenging, though. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, verses 1 to 6. Let me read it for you. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Well, Paul uh, begins this uh, wonderful text by instructing Christians to pray for everyone. Now, Paul uses the phrase all people, and every scholar I could find agrees, both here and in verse 3 later on, all people doesn't mean every individual in the world. That would just be impossible, but the phrase means everyone or anyone, uh, every kind of person, nobody arbitrarily left out. You pray for everybody. You pray for all kinds of people. Just think how radical a command that is. Prayers usually follow one's own personal agenda, right? The people we care about, the causes we care about. I don't think Paul forbids that at all. Such prayers are natural. But Paul doesn't need to urge us to do what is natural. Prayer for everyone, however, is radically unusual. For everyone we know of, for everyone we hear of, for everyone we see who is hurting, and not just the people we know or care for or identify with, them too, of course, but in addition, all the people that we are aware of around us, from television, from social media, any place we become aware of people in distress. We ask God to be merciful. We ask God to bless. Such prayer is unnatural. The natural response is just not to pray at all. We naturally turn away, or maybe we selectively turn away from groups that we don't particularly like, or we get distracted quickly by issues that are involved, why they're hurting. Maybe it's global warming, maybe it's immigration, and we never never get around to get back to the people who are hurting to pray for them. Maybe we think if we can't fix the problem, then we'll just ignore the problem, but we shouldn't ignore any problem. But instead, we should pray. Look how much Paul develops this idea. I mean, he really gives it some thought. He talks about supplications. Supplications are requests concerning specific needs that are keenly felt. That means you're thinking about people and what they're facing right now, specifically. You have to know something about them. This would mean like Californians of every sort fleeing fires, or Catholics who are fleeing violence in Central America or Kurds fleeing violence in Syria. These are supplications for all people, all the people you are aware who are suffering terribly or who are in imminent danger. 
He talks about prayers. This is the most general word here, but in a list where it follows supplications, perhaps we can assume that it means common needs, which are always present. They're not just special imminent catastrophes, but they're just always there. Pray, praying for children who go to bed hungry every night. Prayers for parents who watch their children go to bed hungry every night. Prayer for women who are treated like property. And then intercessions, fascinating word. That, that, it, it, the concept of an intercession suggests taking advantage of a relationship you have with a superior to advance someone else's cause. In other words, taking uh, a need to our God for someone who does not know him. And that immediately suggests prayers for salvation. Uh, people who do not know God tend to not be praying a whole lot for salvation. And so we take the advantage of our friendship with God, which is a gift, and we use that gift and we use that privilege to pray for others. We pray for their salvation since they are not praying for their own salvation. Now, it's not God's expectation that are to, to save every human being. But I, I actually doubt that anyone is saved apart from somebody's prayer. Pray for the salvation, therefore, of, of corrupt politicians in nations where children go to bed hungry. Pray for their blessing as they face needs and pray for their salvation. Pray for the blessing and for the salvation of the gangs in Central America who force families to flee. Pray for uh, the, the empty men who uh, treat women like property and how empty their lives are. Pray. And then thanksgivings. Uh, we recognize that God's hand is behind any blessing to you uh, through the people you are praying for, some of whom are rather close to you. You might work with them or be in their neighborhood. Acknowledge your debt to the goodness of others wherever you can and how the ways they bless you are in fact echoes of God's blessing and blessing comes from him so thank him for that doesn't matter whether they know the Lord personally or not their blessing to you is an echo of God so give thanks to God for what he's done through them to you so in short we're to pray for the specific needs and the general needs of all kinds of people taking advantage of our relationship with God to present their needs to him, including their need for salvation, and thanking God for any blessing we have received through them. Now, why does Paul urge us to pray so much? He says, first of all, not like it's in a list because there's no second or third coming, but it's just like this is the most important thing we should do. Why is that? Well, the answer is given down in verse 3. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You notice the same phrase, all people. And this ties verse 3 to verse 1. It's, it's part of the same idea. The command to pray for all people in verse 1 is explained by the desire of God to save all kinds of people in verse 3. God is going to save all kinds of people in this world in answer to our prayers. Salvation is tied to prayer. So that we, God's children, participate in building the kingdom. This is the first and most important step of the Great Commission. You all know the Great Commission well enough. The Great Commission gives, this, gives us the large narrative of history. What's going on? We tend to focus on our personal lives. That's not only good, it's natural. Uh, but we need to, we need to place uh, our valid concerns in a larger context. You know, we think a lot of, uh, of, of veterans over this weekend. Think of a foot soldier, for example, in battle. Lots of personal, private concerns. Is he going to have food, ammunition, place to sleep? Those are valid and good things to focus on. But there's a larger narrative going on called a war. And in a way, it's the more important narrative because the war is the reason he's there. And when it's over, he gets to go home. We have a lot of personal interests, struggles with jobs and kids and our health, all valid. But there's a larger narrative going on, and that's the Great Commission. We are only here struggling with our jobs and kids and health because the Great Commission is unfinished. And when it is finished, all our struggles will go away. So let's make sure we save a good portion of our energy 
and our prayers for the big thing that's happening. How? How do, I, how do I do that? This Great Commission is so huge. Do I have to go everywhere you know, to reach everyone? Of course not. What I have to do, what I'm told to do, is to pray for everyone. Pray for everyone. Not just a general prayer for salvation, but prayers that get right into the specific right now needs as well as the common everyday needs of any group of people that you're praying about, that God lays on your heart. Because we're going to reach people the way Jesus reached people, by bringing the gospel to them in the context of caring for their needs. Well, what else should I do for the Great Commission besides pray? I would say on first, on first order, don't worry about it. Because if you're praying, God is going to let you know what he wants you to do. And if you're not praying, it really doesn't matter what you try to do. So start with that. Start with having a place in your heart that cares for people uh, who need him and who need help, even those who do need him, but need help. And he will use that to lay on your heart what else to do. What an example of how discipleship rebuilds the way faithful Christians live. Everyone exists in some specific cultural group, as do we. A group defined by economics, race, ethnicity, nationality. And for most people, it's a me-them perspective. It's an us-against-them perspective. But not for Christians, not for faithful Christians. We must pray and seek and desire for God's blessing upon everyone, everyone. Addressing specific concrete needs while pleading with God when necessary for their salvation. For example, and I ask you to forgive me for using stereotypes. I'm looking for some examples we can get a hold of. For example, white American evangelicals must pray for the specific needs and the salvation of liberals, Democrats, Hispanic populations, African-American populations, Asian populations, residents of the inner city, gays, lesbians, transgenders, a growing number of people who have rejected biblical family structure in favor of some alternative. Paul doesn't say here that everyone you pray for is right, just that they need prayer. Now, maybe they deserve judgment as much as you did. No matter, God takes care of judgment. We pray that they will receive mercy just as we did. And so this is a call for genuine, kind, patient, thoughtful prayer. Lifting up to God. Let's take an example. You know, lifting up to God the violence and the bullying that gays face every day still. The ongoing suffering they have with AIDS the turmoil that is experienced by their families and sometimes a lot of turmoil in their own souls. We must genuinely sympathize and care about their pain and plead for God to be merciful and in that mercy bring Christ to many. If you will not pray for them, who will? Now that doesn't mean we approve of their sin any more than we expect them to approve of our sin. But Jesus did not wait for people to change before he cared about them. And his disciples must not wait either. When we look, for example, when we look down on the LGBT community and we refuse to lift them up lovingly to God, we are not acting as the disciples of Jesus. And that's just one group. You see how hard this is. We could discuss immigrants from Central America. We could discuss people addicted in all kinds of ways and who have ruined their lives and maybe helped to ruin some of our life. We could discuss people who are trapped in the inner city of Baltimore, trapped in poverty for generations. Not criticizing them in our prayers. You don't criticize people when you're begging God to be merciful. You just beg God to help them in their struggles, be merciful to them. Someone might say, well, prayer, that's cheap. Well, the people who say prayer is cheap are probably not people who are praying because prayer is not cheap at all. It's a real challenge to do, that, uh, to do the real thing. But in addition to that, a genuine, informed, and caring prayer has a way of opening up the heart 
to do more. That's why it's first of all. First thing to do is to pray with an open heart. It opens your heart up. Verses three and uh, verses one and three form a whole powerful truth that lo- that ties together evangelism, witness, and prayer. And it all starts with prayer. Prayer for people who either are the most afflicted or perhaps the furthest from the gospel. It's lifting up their, their, their practical day-to-day needs, thanking God for any way you possibly can to thank God for them, and asking God to grant them the mercies of salvation. God responds to such prayer by opening up a channel of grace from where the gospel is strong today to where the gospel is going to become strong tomorrow. Okay. Now, right in the middle of this call to prayer that will result in an explosion of witness, another idea, related but distinct, is just kind of pushed in and inserted. Why is this call for specific prayer for rulers inserted in the middle of a call for prayer for all people so they can be reached with the gospel? The answer is a little bit harder for younger folks to understand. If you're younger, you have grown up with electronic text. Whenever you type, whenever you text, you use a word processor of some kind. If you want to delete a word, you delete the word. If you want to change a word, you change it. If you want to add a phrase somewhere, you just add it, right? No problem. I use word processing all the time for sermons and letters and agendas and notes, everything. And I'm always editing my text to make it more readable. The idea, an idea pops into my head in the middle of a paragraph. I just cut that out, finish the paragraph, start a new one, paste it back in. Off to the races. In the olden days, (laughs) we didn't have word processors. We had these uh, mechanical behemoths called typewriters. Let me just tell you, word processors are better. (laughs) Because you cannot edit a typed page. Oh, yeah, you can use liquids and powders to try to change a letter or two. But you can't just add phrases. You'd have to retype the entire page. And if it's multiple pages, you got real problems, okay? In Paul's day, they called typewriters quills. Everything was hand-printed in permanent ink. You couldn't make corrections without making an unreadable mess. Parchment was too expensive to start over. Now, all this is the more significant because Paul dictated his letters. He was nearsighted, and they hadn't invented eyeglasses yet. Okay, so as he dictated, if he expressed an idea as it came into his head in the middle of another idea, that's how it went down on the parchment. There was no going back to restructure sentences. So in this case, Paul has a complete thought to pray for all kinds of people, lifting up their specific needs so we can bring the gospel to every kind of people group, every subgroup in society. And he realizes in mid-sentence that there are certain specific prayers that are also necessary in order for all those subgroups to be rich, or reached. And that is to pray for kings and all who are in high position that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And then he finishes his original thought, God wants all, all, all kinds of people to be saved. If the Christian church is to reach every kind of person in our society and other societies, then not only do we need to lovingly pray outside of our social context for others who need to be reached, we also need to pray for our civil authorities that they not restrict our activity or label us in ways that keep people away. Take a careful look here at what Paul asked asked us to pray for when praying for our rulers. Naturally, when we pray for our rulers, the first thing that comes to mind is for the good of the entire nation, our security, our economy. And praying for that is a very good thing. And it certainly is, un- is under the category of asking God's blessing for everyone. It's, it's a natural thing because it concerns our welfare too. God doesn't have to command us to seek our own welfare. We just do it anyway. But the general welfare of the nation is not what Paul mentions here, is it? It's a specific prayer. That, not that rulers would make the whole nation prosper. Not that rulers would make us prosper. But that our rulers would allow us to lead a quiet and peaceful life. 
just think about, think about this. If the subject is how we live quietly and peacefully, why does, God, why does Paul tell us to pray that when we're talking about rulers? Why doesn't he say, lead quiet and peaceful lives? Or pray for that. He doesn't say pray for your rulers so we can be sexually pure. Pray for your rulers so we can be generous or kind or patient or self-controlled. We can be loving. Why doesn't Paul just tell us to do that? Why make that the subject for what we're praying about when we're praying for rulers? Because this wedge of thought verse 2, is sandwiched in between uh, the middle of a prayer for all kinds of people so the gospel can reach out from us to every subgroup in society. If our rulers perceive us to be a threat to them or to society, they will work to restrict us. They will limit our influence and they will work to limit our expansion. And not only that, but if they feel threatened, rulers will trash the reputations of Christians. So we aren't seen as godly or dignified, but instead in some other unflattering ways. Happened in the first century and it continues to happen. Let me give you two very different contemporary examples. These are really quite different, and yet they're going to end up being very similar. The first example is China. China's communist government officially sponsors state atheism. Now, it recognizes very clearly the right of individual religious belief in five religions, including Protestantism. I have no reason to doubt that. You can believe whatever you want. But it does not, it does not protect the right to practice those religions. In fact, it reserves the right to prohibit any practice it believes might disrupt their social order. So as a result, all churches must be registered. Registered churches are highly regulated. And they've got to restrict their evangelism to actual worship service. In other words, they can only evangelize each other. Okay? Unregistered churches, house churches, are repressed. People go to jail and worse. And the result is that while Christianity survives in China, and actually among the house churches, the illegal ones, it's growing, the spread of Christianity is severely curtailed. Not only are Christian activities prohibited, but the government does its best to discredit unregistered and unregulated Christians. It brands them as troublemakers. So people are suspicious. I believe that the faith in Christ would explode in China if not for the hard boundaries that the government places on Christians. One idea. Let's go someplace else in the world. Let's go to Russia. The Russian government has a long-standing, very close relationship with the Orthodox Church. That was not true under communism. Orthodox Christians were persecuted. But since the breakup of the Soviet Union, that close relationship has returned. Did you know that Vladimir Putin is a professing Christian? He's a strong supporter of the Orthodox Church. He's an active member. He's famous for wearing a silver cross under his shirt. But in 2016, there was a new anti-terrorism law that virtually prohibits all missionary activity in Russia outside of the Orthodox Russian Church. Well, since the Orthodox Russian Church is not known for avid evangelism, that pretty much makes open evangelism illegal and officially brands it as a form of terrorism. How interesting. In China, the government is against the Christian faith. Evangelism is restricted. In Russia, the government is all for the Christian faith. And evangelism is still restricted. In both places, Christianity survives. And in both places, it is regulated and effectively suppressed as much as possible. Paul did not want the government messing with the church. Not when they don't like the church. Not when they do like the church. Because when the government messes with the church, positively or negatively, it doesn't usually work out well for the gospel. When they get involved, governments tend to put boundaries around the church that will inhibit evangelism to those who are already Christian. The goal being to limit the church's influence with other groups and make us a Christian ghetto. Keep us from reaching or expanding beyond to other people, other kinds of people. 
So when Paul urges us to pray for all kinds of people, so that all kinds of people can be saved, he interrupts his thought and he says, wait a minute, this is important. You got to pray for rulers specifically. Pray what? That they would favor the church? No, 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 no. Pray that they'll leave us alone. Pray, pray that they'll let us live quiet, peaceful lives, without their influence or restrictions, letting us earn our own genuine reputation for godliness and for dignity. Because God wants salvation to go out to all kinds of people, not just where we are now. Now, the authorities that were mentioned in this text involve government, but I think that what we learn here is equally applicable to all social authorities outside the home and the church, in our career, our workplace, in school, military, everywhere. We must not allow, if we can possibly help it, we must not allow the gospel to get stuck in any one group of people when all people need to be saved, okay? I thought a lot about how Jesus worked this week. Jesus became immensely popular with everyone. Jews of every kind, Gentiles, none had to be righteous to be loved or helped. And his love called them to a much higher righteousness that flowed out of faith. His universal popularity, however, made him a threat to one, one group, and that's the ruling class. Their strategy to maintain control was to come to Jesus and try to separate him from the affections of different groups of people using important but secondary issues, issues that were hot buttons. They didn't care what Jesus said in answer to their questions. They just wanted him to come down on one side of a contemporary issue or another. And that way, everyone on the other side would be alienated from him. They brought questions about the Sabbath. There are disagreements about that. How rigid is the Sabbath? What do you think, Jesus? They brought questions about divorce. What are the grounds for divorce? You know, there's, we have differences about that. What do you think? What about civil penalties? How harsh should they be? There are different points of view. What do you think? And what about those despised Roman oppressors? <laughs> should we be paying taxes to them? What do you think? hoping that once Jesus took a side and alienated the other side, his general ministry and message would be critically compromised. Jesus refused to simply identify with one side. Partly, I believe, because as with most arguments, neither opinion was completely fair or complete. But mostly... Because while those topics were important, they were nowhere near as important as his mission. His response always, go deeper. Go deeper. Get people on both sides talking about God's will. How rigid should the Sabbath be? You've been healing these people on the Sabbath. How rigid should it be? Well, think about this. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Think about that. Well, what are the proper grounds for divorce? Any reasons, certain reasons, some reasons? Well, I think the first thing we ought to do is talk about what God wants in marriage. Well, well how harsh should our civil penalties be? Here's a woman, she was caught in adultery, it says the stoner. Okay. How about if uh, whoever among you is without sin cast the first stone? All right, you got to answer this one. Do we pay taxes to this ungodly Roman government or not? I think you ought to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. In each case, he focused on underlying issues. He would not endorse extreme positions. And he was always uh, careful not to allow his gospel to be claimed by any social or political issue and thus limit his outreach to all the rest who need to be saved. Boy, I wonder what that would look like today. I read this, and I think that uh, we need to keep the gospel free. We need to keep the gospel available to everyone. Keep it distinct from any group or divisive issue. And help people who disagree look for God's love and his righteousness underneath their divisions. 
And then we have to pray for our rulers in every sector that they might not feel the need to suppress us or use us. And whenever we enjoy that freedom, let's use it to reach out beyond ourselves to where the love of God is most needed. Where to begin, I think Paul tells us very clearly, let's pray for everyone who needs Christ. Everyone. Pray now. Heavenly Father, reading this, I am certain that discipleship requires me to pray for everyone. But I don't do that with the depth and passion you desire from me. And I'm not really sure that I know how to do better. So I pray, we pray that you would help us. Help us even this week to get started rebuilding our lives, changing things to do this. It's what your word says. It's how we should pray. It's all about our witness. It's how we should encourage one another in our fellowship and worship. All those tools you've given us. Help us to use them to rebuild. Heavenly Father, please don't let us become a Christian ghetto, isolated from the rest of society, with people in power using us for their own ends, keeping us isolated. Lord, if that happens... Who will reach all the people who need you? Who will pray for them if we don't? So Lord, amidst all of our authorities and institutions, please allow us to live quiet and peaceful lives, manifesting godliness and dignity. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We administer the Lord's Supper on Jesus' behalf, and we invite everyone who has confessed him in a Christian church to participate. If you're unclear what I mean by that, please talk to me. If you'll not be participating, we invite you to enjoy the music, think about what Jesus could mean to you, and you might enjoy that little, uh, little card called the story in your pew bag. Please come down the center to receive both elements. Or come down to the front, I should say, to receive the elements, take them back to your seat, and consume them any time you like while they're being served. If you prefer to take them standing or kneeling, it'd be easier to do that up here. And please to note that there's a ramp here, so watch your step, okay? Um, if standing in line is not convenient, uh, an elder from the back will serve you. If he doesn't know where you are, ask a neighbor to go fetch him. And while we're in line today, after thanking God for our salvation, this might be a good day to start thinking about a group of people whom you know and feel are hurting. And then maybe they're far from God. And open your heart to care about them, not to judge them. Judgment's very, 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 very important. <laughs> but that's God's job. And open your heart to pray for them, lifting up the things that are hurting them now or discouraging them now, and praying that one day, one day, you might see more of them sharing the table with us. I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. So again, in his name, I welcome you to his table.